Okay, um, five minutes have elapsed. I think we will start. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of SPE University of Bombardier student chapter, I welcome you all. My name is Manel Boaza, a final year computer engineering student at the University of Bombardier, Algeria. Uh, before we begin, and for the sole purpose of avoiding any disturbances throughout the session, I would like to kindly ask you to check if your mics are muted. And if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box below. And I will try to read as many as possible for our speaker to answer them at the end of this session. Thank you. Uh, today's lecture, provided by our distinguished lecturer, will tackle the topic of lost circulation, an old challenge in need of new solutions. Lost circulation remains a challenge in mature depleted fields as well as exploratory prospects. While the challenge is the same, the underlying causes are different. Where there is an abundance of rock properties data in mature fields and scarcity of data in exploratory ones, the evolution of engineering solutions such as MPD, among other technologies like casing drilling, has been significant. That being said, fluid designs in these applications remains critical to the success of the entire operation. A significant challenge is to loss, uh, sorry, to lost circulation prevention and mitigation in selecting the appropriate solutions from those available in the market, rather than a shortage of shortage of such products. Uh, the industry suffers from an overabundance of lost circulation materials (LCM), the majority of which are variations of a few non-innovative types. Current research and development efforts should focus on novel solutions that deliver results in the field a solution-based categorization approach that integrates loss rates and loss mechanisms and links them to the solution having the highest probability of success. This presentation will go through some of these challenges and novel solutions based on test methods, chemistry, and data science tools to the that the speaker will um, believes, sorry, that the speaker believes will revolutionize the area of lost circulation. Our distinguished lecturer today is Mr. Ahmed Amr, a new Parks product line director for digital solutions supporting software initiatives that enhance the customer experience by providing insights through analytics. Mr. Ahmed's career spans over 15 years during which he held field operational, technical and R&D roles in fluids and pressure control domains with a focus on deep water operations and lost circulation solutions. He's also a member of API subcommittee 13 chairman of the 2020 AAD Fluids Conference and is the vice chairman, uh, sorry, he's the vice chairman for AADE Fluids Management Group. At industry events, he has participated as a judge, steering committee member, session chair, reviewer, panelist, and presenter. Mr. Amr has served as an advisor, as an advisor to two graduate university programs, holds IP, has authored 25 publications, including classes to SPE regional chapters, in the field of lost circulation in deep water. Mr. Ahmed holds a bachelor degree from Cairo University and is a certified project management professional. Without further ado, Mr. Amr, the stage is yours. All right. All right, uh, can everybody hear me? Hello? All right. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks for hosting me. Uh, I'd like to really to, to, you know, take the opportunity to thank everybody for, for, for allowing me to present to, to your group. I mean, this is very good attendance for this time of the year and everything. Uh, of course, Ramadan Mubarak, everybody. Uh, appreciate taking the time and, and uh, long days and, and fasting and everything. Uh, I've, you know, my, I've actually come from a family that worked in oil and gas. My father has traveled several times to Algeria. The, the one thing I remember is, is always he came back with the best dates in the world. And, and literally, I mean, and it's Ramadan is kind of the right time to remember that. So I always tell my wife, there is no dates that I can get anywhere like like the ones we, we used to get from Algeria. With that, I'd like to actually move for, you know formally to the presentation. But again, I appreciate the invite. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. So, so lost circulation has been there, you know, like, like the introduction has said, for as long as drilling have existed, right? And it's driven by multiple reasons and then on why it happened and this is what we're going to work through and then the presentation and we'll end up with you know you know a group like yourselves you know still have the you know the opportunity to while studying to do some research some r d what are the new areas that you can focus on and what are the areas that really lacks from enough resources and that you can help close this gap so 
quickly, we'll go over, you know, what is loss circulation and why we're talking about it. Uh, what are the different solutions? How do we actually design a treatment for losses in the field? Uh, testing and validation of what those losses are and, and, and how to like the treatments and the cures. And, and we'll finish by, you know, highlighting the new trends that, that hopefully, you know, get some traction and get some attendance attend from, from everybody to be able to participate. So, you know, real quick, as far as loss circulation, everybody thinks of losses when you're losing drilling fluid only and, and in the case of drilling. Well, it really happens while drilling, while cementing, you know, even completion when you're pumping, you know, brine fluids or while running casing or, or liner, especially, you know, in a tight annulus. So losses can happen in more than one occasion and one, more than one scenario. And while we know how to deal with it more or less while drilling, every different situation, you know, have its own implications. So when you lose fluids while cementing, well, this affects zonal isolation, well, integrity and so, and so on. If you lose in the completion phase, it's really hard to actually cure losses while completing a well because at this point you've probably, especially in a conventional reservoir, you know, treated the filter cake, broke it, and now, you know, you just have a higher loss rate in general and Brian's are, are by, you know, by are clear fluids. They don't have any solids in them. So that makes it more difficult. I mean, how do you cure losses when you don't even have particles in that fluid? Uh, one, one key thing here is API, so American Petroleum Institute, the, the technical piece of it. Uh, drilling fluids or fluids in general are all under what we call subcommittee 13. Uh, subcommittee 13 have a lot of different standards of, as far as, you know, drilling fluids, uh, testing, uh, specifications, right? And, and 13A is where you have what they call purchasing specs. I mean, when you're buying a product that have to do with drilling fluids, it probably have to meet certain specification in 13A, except for loss circulation material. I mean, like polymer, they're there, you know, uh, starches are there, bentonite clays are there. But when you look at bayerite, of course, as a weight material is there. But when you look at loss circulation material, there is very limited references to any specifications. So that leaves a lot of room for, you know, for, for error, for, for not having the same quality, for not having the same consistency, for not having repeatability. You know, when, when you bump something in the field, it works once, it might not work the next, and so on. Uh, a key piece here is regional experience matters and, and sourcing varies. So no, nobody, you know, in the Middle East or North Africa should have to always source lost circulation material from, you know, North America, for example. The reason they use things like pecan shells here or what you hear about nut shells or nut plug is a typical product is because there is an abundance of that raw material here, right? It's something that they plant, something that they make anyway, and that's a byproduct. I've seen in South America, for example, using coffee cherries. You know, so I've seen in uh, Saudi Arabia using date seeds. So every region really have its own raw material. A lot of the loss circulation material are byproducts of other industries, waste streams, or, or something that's very, you know, unique to the area. So, and that's the way, you know, it should be, you know, you don't have to really struggle with a lot of logistics of moving products across the world. But the key part that we will also want to focus on when we're doing R&D and looking at new chemistries is what is the impact on the on, on HSE or health, safety, and environment. We, we don't want to miss that aspect. A lot of those products, if they are nano, for example, there is a breathing hazard that they are chemical based. Well, you have to think about what that chemistry is. And if there are particles, I mean, that does it, you know, does it create any issues for, for the human actually mixing and pumping those products in the field? So well, let's talk about the impact of loss circulation. I mean, we look at this more as a risk matrix. So anybody that's done a risk assessment for, you know, a drilling activity or any activity on a well, you're always going to look at the impact and the probability. And, and, and hopefully if the impact is high, the probability is very low. And if the probability is high, hopefully the impact is very low. You know, otherwise you'd have to stop that activity completely. So, you know, the, the high impact incidents like losing the well completely or going to well control because you've lost the hydrostatic pressure in the well due to losses or getting poor zonal isolation or damaging the well bore, hopefully are less probable of happening because, you know, you, you've cured the losses and you've stopped it before it progresses to that stage. And, you know, on the bottom, you know, things like, just making logistics more complicated or having to run an additional casing string or, or just leading to wellbore instability or, and, and plugging the tools. 
they are a higher improbability for sure. They can happen more and more often, but their impact is, is less. I mean, they, they don't really jeopardize the whole world. They just add to non-productive time. So the key here is look at the non-productive time, uh, look at the cost of each incident, and you realize that losses are costing the industry more than what we think. I mean, there is, you know, wells like geothermal drilling, for example, have shown that up to 20% of a well AFE is actually attributed to loss circulation. So uh, when does losses happen? We don't want to take a generic approach and just say losses are losses and just treat it all the same. We, we have to always do a root cause analysis. So a root cause analysis is looking at the rock, looking at the drilling conditions, looking at a lot of other details to dig deep enough to know what, why are those losses happening. So if we look, I mean, we can categorize them at least to five categories. Uh, one is matrix permeability. So if it's a sandstone that's porous, it's permeable, or certain types of carbonate formations, you're going to see that there is a low fluid loss rate through those, uh, you know, porosity or permeability of that rock. And, and, and this can be treated in a certain way that we'll go over the next slides. Natural fractures are going to be shallow and they're already open, they're already conductive and, and they have, you know, their geometry is different than an induced fracture. The, the induced fractures are going to be when you actually exceed a certain threshold for the rock properties. So if you exceed, you know, the minimum horizontal stress, you're actually going to induce a fracture. And, and the fracture geometry will depend on how much overbalance or how much you're exceeding that pressure and a lot of other for, you know, variables in the rock properties itself, like the far field tresses and so on. Uh, faults are, are something, you know, very interesting. I mean, you, you'll be in the same field and you'll drill one well and you'll have losses and you'll drill another well and you will have losses. And it may have nothing to do with the loss circulation material you used or you didn't use may have everything to do with you were able to navigate the salt, uh, the default map in, in, in the region or that block. So I always encourage people, you know, do you know where the fault is? Do you know what the fault map is? And, and can you navigate the well around it? While of course maintaining everything else, you know, as a priority. Vugs and caverns are very challenging to deal with. They are not very common. They are not, you know, really found everywhere. But when you find them, you'll find that a lot of times they are used with uh, things like a pressurized mud cap drilling, underbalanced drilling, and looking at other chemical solutions. So, so we've class classified what rocks do we deal with. Now let's look at the loss rates. So the industry in general have like a, one or two different loss rates that they look at to categorize the loss rates. And it goes from seepage, partial, severe total, right? To, in, in barrels per hour, of course, you can convert that to, to other units. And some people actually simplify it from like seepage, partial to like severe and total are kind of bundled together. But what's interesting about this is actually the, the graph or the picture on the right. So it's what we would call the fingerprint of that loss if, event. So if it's, if it's a natural fracture, you're going to lose enough fluid until you fill the fracture and your losses will subside. If it's an induced fracture, and as soon as you turn your pumps off, the, the volume actually lost will come back, then, then that's an induced fracture. Of course, the fluid behavior coming back is different from water-based fluids, oil-based fluids, and so on. But also there is matrix porosity and permeability. I mean, how are you, you know, like we talked about permeable rock, this is never a high loss rate. Typically, this is something like 10 to 20 barrels an hour, and it's a low loss rate. And once you cross that zone, the losses will, will eventually just subside. But, you know, total losses, like in, in, in the case of just where, where the loss rate goes up and stays at this level, this is when you're dealing with, you know, caverns and, and, and bugs and, and, and problem, more potentially faults as well. So there is several ways to look at how to categorize LCM. I mean, you can look at loss circulation material from their impact on, on the reservoir. You can look at them from the shape. You can look at them from the type. But the most common way to classify loss circulation material is going to be by type. So fibers is, is of course, you know, you, you'll see in the picture fibers in shape. And, and the reason I say this is, you know, granular material can actually come from a fiber source, but they're still done in, as a granular shape. So, so when you look at that type and uh, flaky material, and, and again, you know, there's a lot of studies that show sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. There are certain conditions where, you know, they have higher chances of success versus not. 
uh, granular material are going to be the typical go-to everybody is using LCM in, in the granular shape, whether it's calcium carbonate, graphite, and, and things like nutshells and other material. But the bottom that's not frequently used is uh, settable fluids and, and reactive pills in general. So let, let's go through like the life cycle of loss circulation material manufacturing development you know whatever you know call it and 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 you always start with the raw material so i get my raw material from a mine i mean and then this is case calcium carbonate the next step is it goes to a grinding facility it gets ground to the size needed and then sizing really gets separated on 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 the on on basically something similar to a shale shaker screens and then the other, the next, th this all happens in the manufacturing side. Once you go to the field, of course, you just have to mix it, pump it, and, and, and really just have hope that it works, right? So that, that's the key part. But mixing, you have to think about, okay, if you have, a, have three different products and I'm drilling something like 50 foot an hour, am I adding the same material? Because I have to, in the field, I have to finish this pallet first and this product second, and this product third. So you really, most of the time, you don't actually get the same consistency of the filter cake or the treatment like you think you do unless you build the pill first and then pump it. And like we showed, the pumping and the sealing is, is hopefully what works next, you know. So what is a typical solution? So here we have the different scenarios that we expected losses to happen at. And we have a variety of solutions from fluid engineering, just you know, using a certain fluid that can help reduce the losses to using particles, so the, these are the most common ones, to moving to chemicals like reactive pills, like we talked about. And really at the heart and core of everything is a well design, is a well architecture. I mean, you, everybody, I, I mean, you, your students in petroleum engineering, you're going to be designing wells. And, and the key part is, you know, designing a well with the right casing points and, and the right number of casing strings to avoid losses and to know what the thresholds of each formation is. So if you want to, you know, kind of look at those different scenarios and how can it be solved, we, we can, you know, take votes here or we can quickly just highlight, okay, well, if I have a matrix permeability, I'm going to be bridging it because you're just bridging the, the poor faces or the poor or the porosity of that rock. If it's a natural fracture, since it's already open, you really just have to plug it. But an induced fracture can be avoided to start with using you know, the right hydraulics models and making sure that you don't actually exceed the rock property. Or if you're going to induce a fracture because your pressures are gonna be higher no matter what, then you can seal it. And, and, and sealing is different than plugging. I mean, sealing is you're, you're designing something depending on a variety of different rock properties compared to just plugging a fracture that already exists. And at the bottom, the bugs and caverns, I mean, this is where you're going to rely more on drilling and well designed than really fluids and, and, you know, chemical solutions, except for, you know, things like what we call swellable additives. An example of these is like uh, what, what people call like uh, super absorbent polymers. Uh, most of the time, polyacrylamides, they, they pull water and they expand, you know, 200 times their size, 300 times their size, depending on the exact chemistry and so on, you can get a lot of expansion there. So when you're looking at a field where losses are happening, are you looking at one well, are you looking at one zone, or are you looking at the whole field? And, and, and the, you know, the most practical way to look at it is, of course, to look at the field. This requires a lot of data. I mean, you're not just looking at one well, you're not just looking at one section, you're looking at a field, you're looking at, you know, decline curves, you're looking at production rates, looking at how much depletion have you had in that rock over time. And then you start, okay, well, how can I manage this field in a certain way where I time my injection wells at the right time, I, I time, you know, not producing a certain rock until you know to, to a high level of depletion that I cannot manage later until I can get to a deeper rock and so on. So there has been a lot of different you know ways of looking at this and looking at how can you just manage a field and, and minimize the depletion rates and everything to avoid high losses. Uh, but you know so so let's start with prevention first when you're designing a solution so let's say you've looked at the field and you've got the data and you still know that you're going to have losses so the first thing to do is to try to avoid them right prevent them so what we call low ecd fluids is like low equivalent circulating density fluids these are fluids that have very low friction losses 
so they don't create a lot of uh, pressure on the bottom hole in the annuals or, or they don't create a lot of friction. And of course, you have to model all this, like we said, we talked about, you know, modeling and simulations. For those of you, you know, that focus on computer science or in, in areas uh, like that and, and drilling, this is a key part, you know, building the right models, validating those models and making sure that they match the field. And of course, the drilling practice. But once you let's say you're going to have fractures, you're going to induce losses anyway, or encounter losses anyway, you have to design a solution. And that solution, you know, you have to think of the material type, which products are available to me. Are there concentration limits from downhole tools? I mean, typically you hear the term 50 pounds per barrel limit for, you know, certain uh, rotary steerable systems, for example. And, and that 50 pounds per barrel is really an artificial number because it's 50 pounds per barrel typically of what they call nut shells medium or medium nut shells. And, and in reality, because of the low specific gravity of that product, that's almost equivalent to like 100 pounds per barrel of the same size calcium carbonate, for example, just based on the difference in volume when you look at the specific gravity. But you have to look at the treatment type too. Are you going to uh, treat the whole fluid or are you going to just pump a dedicated pill to go to the loss zone? And once you do this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak later on why you need a lot of lab testing. I mean, the, the idea is there is not one model that, that can simulate everything that happens down the hole. I mean, there's different assumptions and different models that are available. So you just have to make sure that you do enough testing to get the right data and get the right performance. Don't just take the output from the software and go to the field, you know? And then of course, doing the quality assurance, the quality control on the products, on the material, on the application itself, develop a plan. You cannot just do everything and not have a plan to communicate with the field personnel and then just go in the field and do the execution. So why are, is lab testing important? The lab testing is important because there is more than one theory. If you look at mechanical specific energy, for example, there is one way to calculate it, you know, if you're using downhole data, but when you look at loss circulation, there is really more than one way to, to calculate that, especially wellbore strengthening. And the idea is, you know, each one of those theories that you're seeing on the screen was created by, you know, a credible person working for a big oil company that, that had a lot of research behind it and they all have data to back them up but, but science you know later i'll show that you know there are certain science that shows what works and what doesn't but for example the stress cage theory probably the most common theory that everybody knows about i mean it highlights that yes material type matters material size matters but and and, and it shows that you can actually if you plug the fracture at the right time with the right material you can actually increase the rock strength but fracture closure stress for example you know doesn't really highlight material type or material size it argues that even cuttings can do the job. And, you know, the last theory is fracture propagation resistance where you're really not changing the rock properties, but you're just resisting the propagation of that fracture. So, and, and you know, if that, that's why I, I say from theory to practice here is, you know, you have three theories, but when you look at the core here on the right, you know, a core that was drilled and, and here's the stress orientations and directions and everything, you'll see that the first set of fractures, the short one that are opposite to each other, you can explain that by geomechanics, you can explain that by a uh, stress cage, for example, but it's hard to explain the next set of fractures when you've increased the pressure even more after you sealed. The fracture that you created are no longer the weakest tone of the wellbore, but you've actually created a new set of fractures and those fractures, geometry and curvature and everything, take really a different shape that's hard to predict by a model. That's why, you know, if you look back at this slide and you look at the practical application, you realize there is a lot of room left to build more robust models and predict not just what happens with the first or primary set of fractures, but the next set of fractures as well. So how do we do that? I mean, one, you want to look at fluids modeling. So let's say, you know, you have a poor pressure fracture gradient window. You want to be above the pore pressure, below the frag gradient, and you want to navigate how can you not really breach or, or exceed the safety margin. Well, in this case, you, you exceeded it, you know, in a trip, you know, and surging the hole, for example, and running in the hole. And how can you do that? Well, you can trip in the hole, like, at a slower rate, for example. Uh, the next step is just, okay, I've, I've breached my safety margin, now I've exceeded the rock strands or, or minimum horizontal stress now how much pressure do I really exert on that rock? And that will lead to different fracture geometries. And keep in mind that 
fracture is three dimensional. So every time, you know, the, the fracture grows in width, uh, it's also going to grow in length. So it, 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 you cannot just have, you know, a very short fracture, but very wide fracture at the same time. I mean, it, it just the more, the wider the fracture is typically, the longer that fracture will be as well. And keep in mind in some drilling applications, while well, the drill bit here is in the bottom and drilling, let's say a 12 and a quarter inch hole, you may have a remit right behind it that's 14 and a half inches or even larger. That's again, you know, if it's a short fracture, well, what is that reamer going to do to that fracture and the materials that you've already applied to seal it? So there is a lot of considerations. So typically when you're drilling with a reamer, one of the elements of success there actually is to be able to create a longer fracture than the reamer width itself so that that fracture is still there and it's still sealed and you still, you know, created wall bore strengthening, for example. Okay, so Okay, we, we, so we talked about the models and the fact that they don't all, you know, generate the same data. And, and that's why you need a lot of lab testing. So some of the lab equipment that can be used is, is a simple test that we call a slot tester. And basically what it has is a slot that have the similar fracture width to what you would encounter in the field. And you can run the test and test for like sealing ability. Uh, another way that's a little bit more complicated is actually taking consideration the idea that in a real wall war, you actually have uh, radial flow. And at a very high level, this actually exists. It's not, you know, just a drawing, but there, there is what we call, you know, a downhole simulation cell where you're not just, you know, allowing for radial flow, but you're actually also able to create the the 3D stresses, you know, so your triaxial stresses, your maximum, your minimum, horizontal stresses, as well as the vertical stress and confining pressure and everything. And now you're you're creating what we would call in situ conditions in the field. So you've done all the lab work, you've done all the modeling, you've done everything, and now it's time to translate the results to the field. So it's it's you know some people use what they call decision trees. I, I personally call it you know. A decision matrix and what this you know helps you is one you want to do enough loss zone characterization two you want to be able to apply some best practices on how to do this and and for example you want to know what the loss rate is you want to, you want to know if it's dynamic or static you of course you want to know if the loss zone is known do i know where the loss zone is which means i'm going to spot the pill right across the loss zone. But if I don't know where the loss zone is, then I'm going to have to sweep the hole until I encounter, until the pill finds the loss zone, hopefully, you know. So the, this is why, you know, everything is related. When, when you create a matrix, it's tied to each other. And, you know, the, what is that product mix and how, where do you mix it? How do you pump it and everything? But the, the key part here that people actually, you know, don't look at enough is the placement method right here. And the idea of the placement method is how do I actually pump the pill? Do I pump it first and pull out of it? Do I pump it while pulling out of the hole? Do I bullhead it like they say and just inject everything to the formation? That that really makes a big difference between success and failure, knowing the right pumping or placement method for each one of the pill types for each formation. I mean, there is no one answer for everything, to be honest. So it's just evaluating what works best for that formation for that pill. So We've introduced enough about loss circulation, the impact, and what are we doing today, right? So, so what can we do tomorrow? I mean, and tomorrow is governed by several things. So one, there is not a lot of money left for R&D. There is a lot of uh, competition around oil and, you know, alternative energy and so on. And, and oil companies just don't have a lot of money to spend anymore. So the other element that we're seeing in the industry in general is data science. So there is a huge focus on data analytics uh models and, and just digital transformation in general you know so and and there is a lot of data in the field that if analyzed can can lead to you know better results by just analyzing the data on what combination of factors lead to losses and what combination of factors can actually avoid losses and we'll show an example of that uh the last part is what we you know what the industry calls esg or environmental society and governance so so i mean the hse impact uh, looking at, you know, the society part is, am I getting sustainable products? Are these products rare earth minerals that are going to disappear one day? Am I replacing it? You know, what am I doing to minimize its use and so on? And, and of course, you know, also things like, you know, that are more environmental, like geothermal drilling and, and making it more affordable. 
So the, these are at least you know three of the key trends that we see in the industry, and we'll, we'll show how this ties to what we're doing. So some of the new things that you know that are being done today or we're working on today is uh, you know things that are on modeling in general and data science tools, and of course chemistry. And I, I won't spend a lot of details on this slide. We'll move to actually the details here. All right, so. One thing you need to be aware of is all the models around lost circulation material so far in designing a solution uh, assume that particles are spherical. In reality, almost no particle is a perfect sphere. I mean, all the particles are angular, they are rough in shape, and they are like what you see on the bottom here, you know, more of a just, just angular, bulky particles. So a sphere is just used to simplify the model to make it work better. But when you look at, you know, computational fluid dynamics, you realize that, you know, sorry, sorry the, the, the light keeps going off here it's, it's, if I don't move. So uh, the other part is the shape factors, you know, so there is a lot of factors that come in with the shape that are not really taken into consideration today. And it was more based on computing capacity. It, it takes a lot more power to calculate, you know, the fluid flow around a certain particle, especially if it's angular compared to spherical. And then it's not just each particle, it's how do all the particles interact together. So there are some models around, you know, multi-phase flow or fluid flow in general and on what the particle shape you know, the impact is, and this is a good area to look at because this will minimize a lot the lab work needed because a lot of why you're actually doing more lab testing than you should is because the models are not very accurate yet. So, so including the shape factors in, in any new model will make a big difference. And when we're working on that, but I mean, I, I think there is a lot of room to, to make an impact here. Uh, the other piece is data science and, and you know data science applications. So this is an example from a project in Iraq actually where you know group of students, uh, you know graduate students that actually work in the field or drilling engineers and have you know good experience already. Uh, they brought a data set from their field, gathered the data, did a lot of analytics, started developing models and looking at, okay, what is the probability of success, failure, what worked, what didn't work. And they started just analyzing the data and you will not believe how many times somebody have tried something that they know they already failed like 500 times in the field, but that one rig and that one guy didn't know it failed because they don't have that data. So just by showing them this will not work, move on, try something else, you've increased the chances of success from you know, from only 29% to 92%. And, and of course, at some point, you know, you're able to build predictive algorithms that just if they're connected to real-time drilling data, it's looking at the data and telling you, well, this combination of variables at this depth with these solutions, it will work or will not work. And it's actually rock dependent. So, you know, the shallow or surface hole, the intermediate and the reservoir have three different models tied to them. And, and eventually they were also able to build, you know, what we would call an artificial neural network of, of how, you know, just, just giving the, uh, the model the ability to predict enough details and know what can happen in the future be just based on current data. And, and in this example, this data was from about 800 wells actually. So it's a lot of data that took a lot of work to build. This team was about 40 people. It was not a small team. It was not a short project. It took a lot of time to do the data scrubbing, the model training, and actually doing the field deployment and calibration of the model with field data and everything until the model was validated and just making sure you have all the data sources as well. Cause the data comes from drilling reports, fluid reports, you know, uh, well summaries at the end of the well and so on. So they're just just keep in mind this is not something simple and that's why it's not there for every field, for every area, but it is doable with the right time and effort allocated to it. Uh, the last piece here is something around, you know, what, what's new in the chemistry, you know, that, that we can apply. So when I joined the oil field, originally I thought, you know, the chemistry is maxed out, this is it, there is no new chemistries. And, and I was completely wrong, I mean, we have not really reached even, you know, any limits yet in, in chemistry and, and, and chemical advancement. So 
in the area, I mean, if you look at drilling in general, you're going to be drilling with a water-based fluid or an oil-based fluid. In water-based fluids, there is certain chemistries that you can use to avoid losses. In oil-based fluids, there is other chemistry. So for example, in water-based, you're going to look at things like polysaccharides that can be just cross-linked with the right ion and, and create a gel. Uh, and there's other fluids, you know, what, what's called here mixed metal oxide. It's a highly shear thinning fluid, almost a pseudo solid when it's, you know, when it's not moving. But once you apply any pressure to it, it becomes, you know, very mobile, very shear thinning. Uh, on oil based fluids, I mean, there is several solutions. Uh, everybody's trying to, you know, what, what they call mud to cement. So, how do you take that oil mud and convert it to a solid? And there has been successful trials here. I mean, a lot of those uh, areas are already under patents and they're actually from different areas like uh, UT, for example, here, University of Texas have one patent on geopolymers and one of the silicate manufacturers have another patent on how to, you know, take, use silicate chemistry to convert oil-based fluids to solids. But there is also what I call novel solutions. You know, eutectic metals is a term used to describe uh, a metal with a low melting point. So the idea here is in this picture, for example, uh, on the bottom, uh, these beads or these metal beads are have a low melting point. So if you can create an exothermic reaction and that reaction can melt that metal, that metal will almost have the viscosity of water. And when it have very low viscosity, it's going to flow to the loss zone. And once it cools down again, it's going to become a metal again. So in, in, in reality, you're almost creating like a metal seal in those fractures. Uh, two other technologies are shape memory polymers. You may hear them being referred to shape memory particles. And the idea is just to reduce the particle size to something that you can pump but under certain conditions that it can expand to its previous shape and actually be bigger in size. And, and the last one is nanotechnology. I mean, in nano, there is, you know, there is what you would call, you know, reactive nano or active functional nanos that actually participate in a chemical reaction. But there is also, you know, inert nanoparticles that are just, you know, work basically by physical plugging. So they just help seal the nanoporosity, nanopermeability between the different particles that are already used. Uh, so, I mean, we, you know, we, we're coming to the end of the presentation to open it up for for the Q&A session, but in, in, you know, in summary, really what collaboration is going to be success. I mean, there is a past, you know, we've highlighted, you know, that the past, there is a lot of models, a lot of confusion. There is the present, you know, there is a lot of products out there in the market, but not really a certain simple way to choose which product works when. And the products just have different labels, but most of the time they're very similar. And, but then what can we do for the future? I mean, especially, you know, engineers like yourself either graduated or ready to graduate and, and make an impact. Well, I think collaboration is going to be, you know, key here. So collaboration between operators, service companies, uh, universities, research organizations, and everybody can collaborate more. Uh, data science will have a big impact. I mean, this is an area that have not been used enough, especially in loss circulation. You may see data science in production. You may see, you know, data science in, in other applications like drilling, like make a, connect, a connection, but there is not a lot of data science applications yet in loss circulation. Uh, of course, chemistries, like we highlighted, there is a lot of new chemistries that are, you know, that are possible to use and that are going to, you know, hopefully help solve a lot of the loss circulation problems. But also, you know, just looking at managing the whole field. I mean, like we highlighted in the uh, holistic field management, how can I manage the entire field from the idea of production, depletion, injection, you know, everything that can be done to minimize the pressure, you know, variations to actually be able to avoid losses. So with that, I'd you know, like to return it back to our host and, and just open the floor for the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ahmed, for the lecture. Uh, now for the Q&A uh, session, I would start with the first question. Regarding the role of geomechanics in estimating the best mud weight window for well bore stability, can geomodeling help us dealing with lost circulation problems and maybe guide us to predict the behavior of these lost circulation materials inside the formation. So, so absolutely, the, the geomechanics have a very clear role here. 
on, on what that window is. I mean, from what is a wellbore stability window. The, the challenge you run into is, is two pieces. One is going to be the government. Like, like I, I'll give an example from the US, for example, there is regulations by the government on, on how much you can be above the pore pressure or you have to be above the pore pressure and how much you need to be below the fracture gradient of the rock. So let's say, you know, the government specifies typically about half a pound per gallon over pore pressure and half a pound per gallon below the fracture gradient, you know. But in reality, that doesn't, you know, that is not practical because half point zero, I mean, 0.5 pounds per gallon at 10,000 feet is different in PSI than, you know, 0.5 PPG at 20,000 feet. So, so what is that in pressure? You know, in, 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 in absolute pressure measurements, not just equivalent mud weights and things like that. That's one piece. But then the other piece to your question is, uh, so the nice thing about being a service company and actually not an operator is I, I see a lot of different operators drilling. And one operator will only put like 0 0.2 pounds per gallon above the pore pressure. Uh, some will put two pounds per gallon, 10 times more, you know, over balance to make sure that they don't encounter any, uh, you know, influxes or flows, but that also risks the idea of encountering losses and eventually maybe having a kick anyway, because now you've lost your hydrostatic. So there is a big area here, as long as you, you know, normalize or introduce the rules of what the government specifies for a certain area and what this oil company policy is around drilling. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. If the industry used already numerical methods and data science to improve the R&D side and, uh, and lost circulation solutions, specifically, what is missed exactly and why these kind of models are not successful enough? So, so like I said, I'll go real quick to one thing is the first, nobody's accounting for particle shape right now. Everybody assumes that particles are spherical. The idea behind the assumption that particles are spherical is one number can describe everything about the sphere, its size, its weight, and, and a lot of details. Uh, the other missing piece there is uh, predicting mechanical degradation or shear degradation. So when you add, let's say a thousand micron particle to a fluid and you drill, how long and, and how big that particle will stay and when does it degrade to a smaller size? And, and, and uh, so predicting degradation is something that's not very implemented yet. And of course, the last piece is, well, I've got, you know, sorry here, uh, you've got like uh, three different series in how to calculate a fracture and where does the ceiling actually happen? So one theory is you're sealing the fracture at what we call the fracture mouse. So you need, it's a bigger fracture to seal here compared to your sealing the fracture all across it compared to your actually sealing the rock itself alongside the fracture, but not inside the fracture. So there is more than one assumption that you can apply and it's very hard to validate that in, in the field. I mean, you can do that in a geomechanics lab and see like, like this, but not really something that there is a lot of field data around it. So these are areas, you know, what, what are the right models and, and, and what additional factors can improve the accuracy? So if the prediction is something like 60% accurate, how can we make it 80% accurate? How can we make it 90% accurate and so on? Uh, thank you. There's another one. Uh, is there a possibility that the oil soluble materials used to solve the problem get stuck in the pipe string? If yes, how can we overcome this? So that's, that's actually, you know, if you look at the, uh, here, the, the trends are as much as possible, that, that, that is a possibility. I mean, when you use uh, particles, like, like, or granular material, there is a high risk of plugging the downhole tools and, and the drill string in general, as you go bigger in size. And that's why the idea of looking at reactive fluids in general and settable fluids, I mean, this is basically a gel, a polymer liquid that just gets cross-linked by salinity. And this is also just a fluid. There is no real solids in it that can plug something. So the idea is you, you, there is always a risk of plugging the, down, the, the, the downhole tools and the drill string, but the risk also exists with particles over time. So personally, the, 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 the trick is, you know, the higher the depletion rate, the narrower the mud weight window is, uh, the 
the wider the fracture is, and there is just a certain fracture width that becomes impractical to use a particle to seal it. I mean, like fractures of above 2000 microns are going to be very hard to seal with particles because the particles needed are very big. And because they are large, they are heavier and they tend to settle faster. So you need to increase the viscosity of the fluid to suspend a two or 3000 micron particle. And by increasing the viscosity of the fluid, you're actually increasing the friction pressure loss in the annuals as well. So you're kind of really inducing losses just to be able to suspend the loss circulation material. So the, the, the more, the higher the depletion, the more challenging the losses is. I think chemical pills have a better chances of working than just inert particles that, that are non-reactive. Um, there's another question. When using an, algor an algorithm to predict the loss circulation, what are the main inputs we have to consider? So, I mean, it, it will depend. And I'm, I'm not trying to avoid the question. If you're predicting losses in a natural fracture, uh, it's very simple. You can predict the fracture widths from there's publications and papers that show that you can predict if the fracture is already open, there are algorithms there to predict the fracture widths from just fluid flow. If you know the viscosity of the fluid, if you know the flow, and if you know how much you're pumping versus how much is coming back, you can predict what that fracture width is. That's in the case of natural fractures. Now induced fractures is a different story because now you need to include uh, some geomechanical aspects like the minimum horizontal stress and the maximum horizontal stress. But also, you know, the, the, the theories or the equations that govern inducing a fracture are only valid up to like what, people would consider about six inches from the wellbore. After that, you go under a different rule, set of rules for, for geomechanics, more far field tresses than, than actually near wellbore. So you're outside of you know what people call like more column uh, failure criteria and so on. So it just depends. It's, it's really integrating all those models to, do I have a model for natural fractures? Yes. Do I have a model for induced fractures? Yes. Do those models just predict the fracture or actually help calculate the LCM that can also plug that fracture? Thank you. Uh, how can we define which technology to use from the non-conventional ones, the MPD, UVD, and HPWBM, to mitigate the problem related to loss circulation? And what are the geological parameters that can be considered besides the mentioned earlier? So I'm gonna go quickly to the slide here. Yeah. So, so right here, I mean, the, the, there is not one way to, so, so managed pressure drilling, I've actually done managed pressure drilling for two years of my career. I've done casing drilling for about one year and the rest is really spent on fluid. So I've done very, you know, little, but enough to understand the concept behind it. Uh, managed pressure drilling, for example, IADC or the International Association of Drilling Con Contractors, have what they call MPD candidate criteria. And it's just, it's easier to research what the candidate criteria is because out of all the wells that are out there that are depleted, probably something like 10% is actually a candidate for managed pressure drilling because of other variables like well control. Because you have to have a drilling window already to apply managed pressure drilling. If you don't have a window, managed pressure drilling will not really help. So you, you just have to create the drilling window first and then just manage it. The, the, there is a certain depletion where just the standard mud weight will create losses no matter what. So, so I would look at managed pressure drilling selection criteria, which is from IADC. In casing drilling, there are companies that do casing drilling in general. That's their job. And they look at few different uh, elements. One is uh, what they call like a far factor, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. And it was more around pipe to hole aspect ratio. So there is a certain ratio between the pipe and the hole that works. So if you have like, I, I don't want to misspeak because I mean, I've, I've, the last time I've done this was over 10 years ago. But if, if you have a large enough pipe, it's going to, you know, create what they call smear effect and it's going to crush the cuttings and, and basically uh, line the wall bore. But if you have a small casing, or in, in a larger hole, then you don't get the same effect. And, and the challenges are, it's really more around the pipe or the casing in this case itself is uh, 
you're limited to so many RPMs because, you know, unlike drill pipe that you just continue rotating and you just pull it out and replace it and you do all the, you know, API inspections and drill pipe, when you're dealing with casing, there is a fatigue limit and you're allowed so many RPMs, you know, like, like one, one well I was on, you had, a, you had about a million RPMs. Once you reach 1 million RPM over time, over days, of course, of drilling, you really have already reached the fatigue limit of that casing, for example. So there is a lot of variables that go in there about the casing grade and, and, and you know, in, in case of casing drilling. So each one of them is a lot of work. It's not very simple to, to decide, you know, is it, does it work or not? But once you do it for one or two wills, you build the knowledge of, you know, can I apply it here? Can I apply it there or, or not for the field itself? Thank you for the explanation. Uh, nowadays, uh, most use overbalanced drilling procedure or LCM are mixed with drilling mud continuously. I don't know if you understood the question, but this is how it was written. I, I think I think I, I understand this, yes. So, so it's actually a good practice. What happens is there is a lot of geomechanics studies that are done and some of them are published even in ARMA, which is American Rock Mechanics Association. And the idea is the studies show, and this is geomechanics testing in the lab, is if the LCM is not present and you induce a fracture, then you stop, then you pump LCM, you're only going to plug it. You know, this is, you know, you go to just plugging. Plugging a fracture does not redistribute the stress around the wall bore. It just stops the fluid flow into it, but you still have a weak zone. Compared to if the material or the loss circulation material is already in the drilling fluid while drilling, once you encounter the fracture, you know, immediately the material seals that fracture and redistributes the stress around the well bore and help create well bore strengthening. And that's what you see uh, here. You know, that's the idea of, okay, I sealed this initial fracture is enough that they are actually not the weakest part of the well bore anymore. And the weakest part of the circumference of the well bore is now a new area. So instead of propagating the original fracture, now you're creating a new set of fractures. And that's the idea because you've had the material in the fluid while drilling already, which if you want to do well bore strengthening, typically what we would call background treatment or material treating the whole fluid works better. Uh, are the tests used nowadays, such as the uh, leak-off test, reliable to prevent a lost circulation? No, they are not. <laughs> you know, the, the, the short answer. The, the, so you have a leak-off test. So to really get geomechanical data enough to predict losses, you need to do an extended leak-off test, not just a leak-off test. That's number one. Number two, a lot of, you know, the data around the leak-off test captures the surface mud weight but doesn't capture two other variables. One, the temperature at which the mud weight was measured and uh, the, the compressibility of the fluid, you know, water-based, oil-based, and so on. So you may know the surface mud weight, but you don't really know the downhole mud weight, especially when you're going from oil-based fluids to water-based fluids and changing compressibility or literally just the difference, you know, some areas in the U.S. that gets to freezing in the winter. If you say my mud weight was 12 pounds per gallon at, you know, at negative 10 degrees Celsius, that's not the same as, you know, the same 10 pounds per gallon at 30 degrees Celsius in the summer, that, that fluid density changes. So, so we just need more data. Number one, getting an extended leak off test when possible. Number two, collecting enough data around the fluid itself, the temperature it was measured at and the compressibility. Uh, what are data science models used to predict exactly? Is it the loss area or the mud volume? So it's, okay, so over here, it's really looking at, so, I mean, you could, there, there is different ways to look at it, but in this case, because the data was already there, one, it was going to predict will losses happen or not? Yeah, just a yes, no question, you know? So based on those conditions, will you know, what is the probability of, of, of losses? Uh, number two is going to, you know, other models would predict the fracture geometry. And from there, 
very, very few models actually are, can predict the fluid volume at this point. Uh, what impact does the surging pressure have on lost circulation? So, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's not quantifiable because it goes from different well profiles and, and how tight the annulus is after you run the casing or by running the casing. But I would say that the, the, the worst, so when you're running in the whole surge pressure, there is surge reduction tools that can be used. So creating an alternative flow path and minimizing the surge pressure, or you can trip in the hole faster. The challenge is not really just the surge pressure. While well, you're running casing, the next step is cementing. Uh, cementing typically, or cement, have higher density than drilling fluids and also have uh, higher viscosity sometimes. And it has a very tight annulus because now you're using casing instead of drill pipe. So most losses actually will happen when you circulate with, with, with cement, with casing on bottom. Especially as the cement starts filling more and more of the annulus and it just have a much higher hydrostatic than the drilling fluid at that point. So that's when losses can happen. Another participant, uh, first of all, she thanks you for the insightful presentation. And she's asking, what are the hydraulic effects of lost circulation and its implications in contaminants migration? So from hydraulics perspective, I mean, you're losing a certain amount of flow into those fractures and instead of just being in the annulus cleaning the hole, right? And, and depending on how much losses you have and, and, and how much impact you have, I mean, sometimes you have to slow down your flow rate enough where, where at this point you're just, you know, creating more hole cleaning issues, leaving more cuttings and, and those cuttings, the longer they stay in the well board, there's a lot of studies around hole cleaning. The longer the cuttings stay in the well board, the finer they break, to you know, smaller particles. So eventually, the longer re residence time, you would call it the cuttings are staying in the well bore, then you create more fines and there is a potential for fines migration. Yes, depends on the reservoir, of course. So, so just the, the faster you can pump, the better you can clean the hole, the better you, know, you avoid this. Okay, um, another participant is thanking you for the excellent and very informative presentation. And he's asking uh, the following. Let's assume that we are in a situation where our only concern is the induced fractures. Is in this case, MDP, managed pressure drilling, is a solution to avoid the problem of uh, LOC. So, like, like I said, managed pressure drilling allows you to drill if you have a mud weight window already. So if you have, an, let's say you have one pound per gallon window, or let's say it's like a thousand PSI, you know, between pore pressure and fracture gradient, you can do managed pressure drilling to minimize those pressures by like 200 PSI, 300 PSI and so on, and, 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 and keep a safer margin. So yes, it's helpful, but if there is no window at all to start with, then you really have to reconsider the well design and, and something like well bore strengthening. I always say, you know, managed pressure drilling helps stay in the window. Well bore strengthening helps create a window. You know, it just, you're actually able to strengthen that rock. Uh, what is the role of the reservoir engineer and the geologist in this situation, especially when you have to act rapidly? So the geologist is, is, is just characterizing the rock and, and knowing you know, where exactly we are and the potential areas. Because you could be in a development field that you've drilled already for five or 10 years and you may find a new fault. So just being able to identify those areas. The reservoir engineers, I mean, the, 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 the tricky part here around reservoir engineers is uh, right here, just a second, sorry. Yeah, right, right here. You know, if you have like, let's say two different reservoirs, you know, and, and this is not two different reservoirs. I know this is an aquifer, but let's just assume there are two different reservoirs. But let's assume you've discovered this reservoir, you know, the middle one, uh, 10 years ago. That was the only drilling technology available. You know, the rigs can only drill that deep because really you were limited in top drive capacity, drill bits, and then other options, right? So, and, and seismic and everything. Now, 10 years later, there's a lot of technology to help you get to that new deeper reservoir. 
that you couldn't see 10 years ago. Now, how do you get to that deeper reservoir while, you know, drilling through a very or a high depleted reservoir in the middle? So it's some reservoir engineers have seen do something like they produce enough of the bottom new reservoir and then they produce the two zones together. Some do like a dual zone completion. It's just really depends on what the strategy is and how complicated it is. Every well is a case. Are the predicted models really a good approach when it comes to areas that are still in exploration phase? No, so so like I said in the in the very beginning, and, and, and you read it in the in the development or the introduction of the presentation, there is not enough data in an exploration field to, to, to create those models. You know, it's 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 going to be less and less accurate the less data you have. Uh, so far, I have read all the questions from the um, chat box. If you have any, please feel free to write them. All right, uh, any more questions? Well, apparently not so far. Right. Uh, there's another one. Uh, how does the DLS affect the lost circulation? So do dog leg severity is, is an interesting concept. There is a paper that Chevron published about three, four years ago. Of We're not even capturing dog leg severity. What, what happens is directional driller on the rig, every time he gets a survey that he doesn't like, he just gets rid of it. You know, so, so the data you have about what this looks like versus what it really it is, 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 is not very accurate. Of course, this creates, you know, what we call tertiosity and, and, and a, you know, a more difficult well bore to navigate and, and probably impacts hole cleaning. And then if you impact hole cleaning, you know, just think about dog leg severity as can my cutting navigate this area? Or when I turn my pumps off, will the cuttings just fall to the bottom quickly, you know? And, and if you're impacting hole cleaning by dog leg severity, then you're also impacting ECDs and you're also contributing to losses. Okay, uh, there are no questions. So uh, thank you so much everybody for attending and thank you Mr. Ahmed for your valuable insights and for the presentation. Thank you for hosting and, and I'm available, you know, to be in touch with anybody, feel free to reach out and, and good luck with everything and look forward to eventually meet, you know, in person when there is a chance to travel as well. Thank you.